Hello and welcome to yet another session of this course on literary criticism. We are looking at F. R. Lewis' work, The Great Tradition, which became uh, very fundamental in laying the foundations of modern literary criticism and also for professionalizing literary studies in multiple ways. That was something that he had been doing from the 1930s onwards. And we find a continuing influence of uh, Eliot's idea of the tradition in his uh, notion of uh, literary tradition as well. And we have been looking at how he had focused on primarily on and just a handful of select uh, English uh, novelists to talk about the great literary tradition that novel has. And while talking about uh, Jane Austen, which is what we shall be looking at in this uh, uh, current lecture, sh he talks about Jane Austen's relationship with tradition as a creative one. And we find that just like Eliot did in his essay, The Traditional Individual Talent, here also uh, Lewis is taking a very interesting uh, look at the idea of the tradition and it is not in the traditional sense that he wants to look at tradition but as something which is uh, in continuity, which is uh, in flux, something which is uh, which has the power to encompass the past and the present and uh, in that sense while well, uh, he is talking about the relation uh, that the relation that Jane Austen has with tradition, this is what he says. She not only makes tradition for those coming after, but her achievements has for us, a, for us a retroactive effect. As we look back beyond her, we see in what goes before her and see because of her potentialities and significances brought out in such a way that for us, she creates a tradition we see leading down to her. So we find a certain sense of continuity and also about the way in which the past and the present and the future ahead merges in a and in a, in, in a certain kind of historical streamline, her work, like all the work of, like the work of all creative, uh, all great creative writers, gives a meaning to the past. So it is uh, when we are looking at the oeuvre of uh, Jane Austen, it is not just about her own work, her body of work. It gives meaning, it gives potentialities, it gives a trajectory, it gives a positioning to the writers who went before her. Like uh, Lewis was trying to establish in the previous passage as well, all the other great fiction writers, the pioneers who went before her, their stature and their positioning and their significance becomes more accentuated when we look at how Jane Austen has used this tradition to her, uh, to her advantage. And Jane Austen here is being seen as someone who gives meaning to the past writers. Jane Austen's work becomes significant not just for the present era, not just for setting standards for, for the future, but also for us to make sense of the kind of writings and the kind of work that went before her. So this continuity, this historical sense that uh, Lewis gives to tradition, the understanding of tradition is something that we find him uh, taking off from Eliot's time onwards and it is also extremely important in our understanding of canon formation and our understanding of the ways in which particular writers are positioned and their significance uh, getting accentuated at various points of time. As mentioned before, Lewis had uh, worked extensively towards a professionalization of literary studies and as part of that we find this 1948 work contributing much towards the uh, canon making process, towards uh, uh, solidifying many things in terms of uh, curricula, in terms of uh, uh, university teaching. So we do find him using some of the text and using certain kinds of frameworks which would be useful uh, for framing the ways in which this discipline has been uh, emerging as well. So this is uh, uh, what he says in the at the opening of the uh, next paragraph. Having in examination papers and undergraduate essays come much come much too often on the uh, proposition that George Eliot is the first modern novelist. I finally tracked it down to Lord David Cecil's early Victorian novelist. So we find him trying to reassess the canon. We try him. Uh, we we find him uh, trying to engage with history, engage with the canon making process, and also reassessing the works based on the framework that he is proposing. In so far as it is possible to extract anything clear and coherent from the variety of things that Lord David uh, Cecil says by way of explaining the phrase. It is this, that George Eliot being concerned not to offer primarily an entertainment but to explore a significant theme, a theme significant in its bearing on the serious problems and preoccupations of mature life, breaks with those fundamental conventions both of form and matter within which the English novel up till, up till then had been constructed. So based on that, he is asking, what account then are we to assume of Jane Austen? Clearly one that appears to be the most commonly held, she creates delightful characters. Now, after having told us extensively how he would like to position Jane Austen and how she is very conveniently positioned in such a way that her presence, her body of work gives a sense to the past, he now goes on to examine 
uh, Jane Austen's works in detail and first of all he says he also agrees with other critics who has uh, mentioned the same thing that she creates delightful characters. Compare Jane Austen's character characterized with Scott's a record examination question. He's also making his discussion in alignment with the uh, discussions within the uh, classroom as far as this uh, discipline of English literature is concerned. And then uh, uh, having said that he also dwells at length with some of the comparisons that uh, Cecil also makes uh, in, in terms of the comparisons between George Eliot and Jane Austen and uh, he also quotes some passages uh, into which we will not be spending much time. So then he moves on to say if Jane Austen's plots and her novels in general were put together very deliberately and calculatedly if not like a building but her interest in composition is not something to be put over against her interest in life nor does she offer an aesthetic value that is separable from moral significance. Here we come to the most important point that Scott is about to have here and we come to the most important point that Lewis is about to highlight about the moral preoccupation that he thinks Jane Austen had and that according to Lewis elevates Jane Austen above all the other writers and this is how he uh, goes on to talk about her craft. The principle of organization and the principle of development in her work is an intense moral interest of her own life that as in the first place a preoccupation with certain problems that life compels on her as personal ones. She is intelligent and serious enough to be able to impersonalize her moral tensions as she strives in her art to become more fully conscious of them and to learn what in the interest of life she ought to do with them. Without her intense moral preoccupation she wouldn't have been a great novelist. So he is here underscoring what he thinks is the greatest contribution, is the greatest uh, uh, notion, the, 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 the greatest quality that made Jane Austen the great novelist a great novelist her intense moral preoccupation and this is something that Lewis continues to emphasize on throughout this discussion of the great tradition this account of her work this account of her would if I had cared to use the formula have been my case for calling Jane Austen and not anyone later the first modern novelist so he is departing from one of the points that Cecil made uh, where he calls George Eliot as the first modern novelist and uh, here Lewis begs to differ and he says according to him the first modern novelist would be Jane Austen and uh, in applying it to George Eliot he finds it very problematic that Cecil applied it to George Eliot and by the end of this paragraph he almost concludes and categorically states Jane Austen in fact is the inaugurator of the great tradition of the English novel and by great tradition I mean the tradition to which what is great in English fiction belongs. So here uh, this is a 1948 work and novel is still a young genre but uh, as uh, we discussed in the at the outset of this uh, essay Lewis finds it very imperative to take stock of the work and also to pronounce some greatness to this young genre which had been seen as uh, something without the baggage of tradition here he is trying to establish he's trying to construct a tradition into which the other other novels could be included now he's discussing about the integral part of fiction form. The great novelists in that tradition are all very much concerned with form. They are all very original technically having turned their genius to the working of their own appropriate methods and procedures. But the peculiar quality of their preoccupation with form may be brought out by a contrasting reference to Flaubert. Yeah? So form becomes extremely important here when Lewis is discussing and even over here there is a superiority that he is able to attribute to Jane Austen as we say towards the essay is toward the end of this paragraph. The novelist's problem is to evolve an orderly composition which is also a convincing picture of life. This is the way an admirer of George Moore sees it. Lord David says attributing this way to George Jane Austen crediting her with the superiority over George Eliot and satisfying the rival claims of life and art explains the superiority we gather by a freedom from moral preoccupations that he supposes her to enjoy. So there is a certain fine balance also which is being brought over here. There is an intense pre moral preoccupation because of which he uh, Lewis argues that Jane Austen is uh, best fit to inaugurate this tradition and he is she is considered as a great novelist and she is considered as the as someone who has set this tradition in place but there is also a certain superiority of form that is being attributed to her and he goes on to talk about the formal perfection of Emma and about the aesthetic matter a beauty of composition that is combined miraculously with truth to life so there is aesthetics and life coming together and uh, if you recall the 
definition that Henry James also attributed to fiction. It is something which is competing with life. Fiction is something which is forever competing with life. There is a way in which fiction tries to overtake life, simulate life, uh, imitate life and there is a very strong competition in real life. So uh, having said that, truth to life and this perfection of form both become extremely important in Levy's uh, framework as well. And now uh, Levy's is also conscious about a certain flip side of this genre of, of fiction. It might be commented that what I have said of Jane Austen and her success is so only what can be said of any novelist of unqualified greatness, truth to life or perfection in form or this uh, a preoccupation with moral intensity. These could be very loosely identified and attributed to any novelist perhaps. So what is it about uh, Jane Austen and this great tradition that he identifies what is very significantly different about them. But there is and this is the point an English tradition. So this is extremely important look at the way in which he, he has italicized is also there is and this is the point an English tradition and these great classics of English fiction belong to it. A tradition that in the talk about creating characters and creating worlds and the appreciation of Trollope and Mrs. Gaskell and Thackeray and Meredith and Hardy and Virginia Woolf appears to go unrecognized. So we find this trajectory fully forming, fully developing over here. There is an English tradition and then this uh, assertion, this is very very important, this is very very important to uh, further the uh, ambitions in terms of uh, a literary tradition. This is very very important in order to separate a particular kind of an English tradition as far as uh, novel is concerned and from being a genre without any baggage of tradition. He is here able to nativize this tradition. Uh, Levis is able to provide a a very nativist kind of tradition to the emergence of novel. An English tradition could be identified regardless of the other important writers who existed in different languages and in different cultures. And what Levis here is concerned is about this tradition and this sentence. It's it's, it's, a, it's a very categorical statement. It does not it's not ambivalent. It is very very assertive in its quality. But there is. And that is, and this is the point, an English tradition and these are great classics of English fiction belong to it. And there is no debate, this is not an open-ended thing that he proposes before us. The presence of an English tradition is something that he is uh, uh, able to assert, that he is able to position here beyond any kind of debate. And the underlying politics of this and the um, many biases which are inherent in this, uh, that's something that we shall take a look at after we have gone through the first chapter. Again, while talking about the greatness of George Eliot, we find the way in which that is again connected to Jane Austen. Look at this. One way of putting the difference between George Eliot and the Trollops, whom we are invited to consider along with her, is to say that she was capable of understanding Jane Austen's greatness and capable of learning from her. So this is another significant thing about tradition. One great writer is able to recognize the greatness in another writer. One great work is able to imitate or follow or situate itself in the greatness of other. And in that continuity, he also states, and except for Jane Austen, there was no novelist to learn from, none whose work had any bearing on her own essential problems as a novelist. This is very, very important. And in uh, George Eliot's identification of Jane Austen as the only novelist from whom anything could be learned, this effect of tradition is further accentuated. And here, uh, Leibis is also uh, not allowing certain other kinds of dialogue to exist over here. There is an inherent greatness that is being attributed to Jane Austen for her essential uh, moral preoccupation, for the perfection of form, for the wonderful characters that she created and for her ability to imbibe from the past and also more importantly her ability to stand as a, an imitable figure, her ability to stand as this pillar of tradition uh, which the others can imitate, which the others can emulate and take off from. So Jane Austen here becomes not just the first great novelist but also someone on whom this entire foundation rests, not just her uh, period but the past, the present and the future. Henry James, he says, also was a great admirer of uh, Jane Austen and in his case too there is that obvious aspect of influence which can be brought out by quotation. And there is for him George Eliot as well coming uh, between. In seeing him in an English tradition, I am not slighting the fact of his American origin, an origin that doesn't make him less of an English novelist of the great tradition than Conrad later. That he was an American is a fact of the first importance for the critic. And as Mr. Yor Winters brings out admirably in his book Maul's Curse, Mr. Winters discusses him as a product of 
the New England ethos in its last phase when a habit of moral strenuousness remained after dogmatic puritanism had evaporated and the vestigial moral code was evaporating too. This throws a good deal of light on the elusiveness that attends James' peculiar ethical sensibility. I want you to see the politics over here. The very evident imperialist politics which is also talking about the nation, about nationalism, with, uh, with various attributes. And we find literature, in spite of its humanist tradition, in spite of this, uh, 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 this far-reaching look that it seems to advocate, there is also a certain way in which ownership is being taken in terms of nationality, in terms of ethnicity. And the ways in which this dialogue is being able to, uh, this dialogue is being promoted over here. And two writers are being discussed over here, uh, writers of English origin, writers of uh, American origin. And there is a way in which the American writer, the American critic is also being appropriated into the English tradition. And this is what I want you to see in terms of the idea of the tradition that uh, Lewis is trying to foreground. And uh, you may also hear very conveniently recall that even Eliot was uh, of American origin. And there is a way in which some kind of appropriation takes place when it uh, comes to the framing of tradition. And we find that finally at work over here as well when Lewis is trying to establish an English tradition, when he says there is an English tradition. And that is something which is not open for any kind of a debate. And based on that assumption, he moves forward with the other kinds of discussions as well. And here, uh, it, it's also uh, amazing the way in which uh, within the context of literature, many of these things are coming together. It's not just about aesthetics, it's also about the politics, it's also about the politics of uh, uh, the identity. And we find all of this coming together in this discussion of canon formation that uh, that uh, Lewis undertakes in his seminal work, uh, The Great Tradition. So with this we wrap up for today and, uh, and uh, we will continue discussing this text and we should also look at the implications of this work in forging this great tradition and the implications of this work not just in terms of understanding the tradition of uh, English fiction but also how this provided larger frameworks, how it provided ample methodology for other uh, canon formations, for other processes of canon formation to take off from mid 20th century onwards. So with this we wrap up the discussion over here and I look forward to seeing you in the next session. Thank you for your time and attention.